Thank you very much. It's good to be with you this morning and to share in your, your service here uh, in, in Moy. Could we turn together, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> and we're commencing to read, please, at verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, commencing to read at verse 5. Jesus said, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer, please. Our Father, we come before thy throne of grace this morning in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy to us in that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. We thank you, Lord, for your great compassion toward us who were doomed, Lord, by sin and, Lord, destined to judgment and to hell. We thank you for your amazing grace that rescued us We thank you, Lord, for the hope and the certainty that we have that one day we will be with thee and be like thee for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, for the words of the hymn, There is a happy land far, far away where saints in glory stand, bright, bright as day. We thank you there's a better land than this land, Lord. We thank you there's a better country. And we come to you this morning and we ask that something of the beauty and the love and the wonder of that country would invade this meeting this morning. Something of your presence, Lord, would descend amongst us, that we would sense the Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would draw near to us by your Spirit. Afresh, I, Lord, give myself to you, uh, all I have and am, and Lord, I claim your cleansing and sanctifying power on my spirit, soul, and body. And Lord, I ask that you would give and grant the Holy Spirit. Lord, send the Holy Spirit that he may come amongst us. And Lord, in Jesus' name, I take authority over every other spirit that would be contrary to the Holy Spirit, every spirit that would be working to blind, to nullify the influence of your word. Father, open our hearts that we might hear your voice. And grant, Lord, a wall of fire round about us and your glory in the midst. We ask it giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I would like to speak to you this morning on the verse 6 of chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel. Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. This word that the Lord Jesus used in talking to his disciples, he related uh, this truth of a closet. A closet. And of course, the closet is really the test, the true test of our devotion and our love to the Lord. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to be involved and active in church life 
I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's much easier to go to meetings and much easier to be involved in meetings and to talk to people and to share with people than to be in the closet. The closet has this strange love-hate relationship with us, and uh, many Christians, for a variety of reasons, have abandoned and left the closet. It was a place where Jesus directed his disciples, a place, a private room, an inner chamber, where they would go and spend time alone in his presence. And before we commence the meeting, really, this morning, I want to ask you to honestly answer this question before the Lord. Do you, first of all, have a closet? Do you have a place where you go regularly on a daily basis, and there you meet with the Lord? Uh, If the answer to that is no, then the Lord doesn't want to condemn you. He doesn't want you to feel constantly condemned, but he does want to rectify it. He does want it to be healed, because there are so many areas where the Lord would love to minister into your life, but because you have abandoned the closet, the Lord has difficulty in communicating with you, for that's the purpose of it. You see, when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, he was first of all created by God. But the purpose of the creation was communion. That was the sole purpose of God creating Adam. He wanted communion. And Adam and God communed together every day. He carried the presence of God with him every day. And in the eventide, the Lord would come in in an unusual way. The Lord would come to the garden. And there Adam and God would, would talk. There they would share. And that would have been something that Adam looked forward to. It was something that he enjoyed. But because of sin, that desire for waiting on God stopped. Do you remember when Adam had sinned that the Lord came to the garden and he said, where art thou? Adam had hid. And Adam didn't want to be with God anymore. And that's what sin does to us. It leaves us that we don't want to be with God. We don't want to be in his presence. It's boring. It's uneventful. It's uh, unproductive. So we say, well, I I don't want to do that. I don't do that. I do church. I do meetings. I do I do the prayer meeting maybe I do um, you know but I don't I don't do the closet I I don't do that that doesn't work for me and so the very purpose for which the Lord redeemed you that very thing doesn't work so therefore Christianity doesn't work for you and what you find is that people who are in that predicament what they do is they become rather than spiritual people or or godly people, they become religious people. Now, the evangelical church has lots of religious people, but they're not godly people. They're not people who love God, for they've no time for the closet. But they're religious people. Now, I had an experience just recently, and the Lord really spoke to me through it. I was at a series of meetings that were, and in, in for, for me anyway, they were quite unique because um, the Lord has been working in this particular church in a number of ways, and they have really been making room for God in this church. And uh, there's done a lot of sorting out, and a lot of things got fixed, and people that were in positions they shouldn't have been in, they resigned. And it took a while, but they got the church into a place where God could begin to work. And uh, when God began to work, I was invited to come along and did a, a short series of meetings. But one night when I had closed the meeting and went to the door, um, the pastor, who was obviously more sensitive to the Lord than I was, he came up to the platform and he said, I don't think the meeting's over. He said, I feel that God wants to do something with some of us tonight. And so he made a very brief appeal, um, and then he knelt at the altar himself. And uh, to my amazement, a number of people left the pews and came to the front, and some of them bowed their heads down in between their legs, and uh, many of them young people, some middle-aged, but most of them young. 
and really earnestly. And do you know the presence of the Lord came down in such a, a way I've never experienced it before in my entire life, that, that, the way that happened. Never saw it before because the Lord helped in the preaching. But, but when the preaching was over, it just went into another dimension. And uh, the presence of the Lord was so powerful. And people stayed at the altar. They, I don't know how long, maybe an hour or I don't know how long, but they just stayed there. And some people, just their heads down in between their knees, never moved. The presence of God was so powerful. And I, I really felt so unworthy even standing behind the pulpit. And I, I eventually just had to kneel down myself on the pulpit. But do you know what happened? As the presence of God was so powerful in the meeting, people started to walk out. Now, I'm used to that. I mean, I, I've seen that. But the ones that walked out had head covering, hats, and the right Bibles. They all walked out. When I looked down here, there was young ragamuffins. <laughs> T-shirts, jeans. You know, it, it just wouldn't be my thing, you know. And the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, there's something radically wrong. Because here was the presence of God. And the people that apparently had it all right walked out. They knew nothing about communion with God. But the young ones <laughs> that didn't dress right, that didn't look right, I don't know what Bible they had. Dear only knows what they had. And they're on their faces before God. And the Lord said to me, there's something radically wrong. And I have to say that it is really, really, God has really spoke to me through it. Because there's an awful lot of evangelical Christians... And they're not spiritual people. They're not, they're not God lovers. They're religious people. They're likened to the Pharisee. You see, the Pharisee had loads of rules. Now, how can you tell a religious person from a spiritual or a spirit-filled person? It's very easy. The religious person from a distance gives the impression that they're very godly. But when you get in close on them, there's a hardness in them. There's a hardness. They tend to be quite a critical person. The person who is spirit-filled, there's a sweetness in them because of the Holy Spirit in control of their lives. And it can be very hard for some people to discern who really loves the Lord and who's religious. And I have come to realize that the religious environment is not a God environment. And for that reason, I'm going to make a statement that may shock some of you. I've said it before, but I'm more convinced now than ever that when God works in this land, which he will do, that I fear that a lot of our evangelical churches that hold very strongly to certain things, that God will not come to them. His presence will not come. Because there's not the love for God. It's the love for religion and rules. I trust you can understand where I'm coming from. You see, I'm not suggesting that you just come to church anyway. I'm not suggesting that, you know, you change certain things that you hold. I'm not suggesting that. But what I, what I can see so clearly and what I felt the Lord showed me so clearly was God wants to be wanted. And there were a bunch of young people and they wanted God. <laughs> and there were also a number of people and they had had enough of God. They had enough. 
I don't want to sit anymore in the presence of God. I'm not so sure many of them even knew that it was the presence of God. So the Lord says, go into your closet. I guarantee you that the average religious setup in the average evangelical church is absolutely prayerless. If there even is a closet among the people, now this is not all people obviously, but I'm, I'm talking in general terms, but the, the average Christian, even if they have a closet, it is a very brief affair. And for many Christians, it is a kind of a purgatorial thing or something that you have to go through because you know you're a Christian, so you're meant to do this. But as far as really enjoying it or enjoying coming out of the closet and saying, I enjoyed being with the Lord today, that would be foreign language. That would be something I really don't know what you're talking about. And dear friends, that is the root of the problem today in the church. That is the root of the problem. We do not have a love for God. That's the problem. We don't love God. You see, Pharisees loved so many things. They were very religious. They loved the Scriptures. They loved holiness as they saw it. They loved truth. They believed in the resurrection. There were many things about the Pharisees that from a distance looked good. But the Lord on all occasions condemned them, on all occasions, <clears throat> because it was false. They didn't have a love for the Lord. The Lord Jesus wants to challenge you and I regarding this area of closet. And, and can I say to you in love, if, if you don't have a closet, can I encourage you to get honest with the Lord and tell him that, Lord, I don't have a closet, and I don't even have a desire for the closet. It would be so important that you would do that. Because, you see, that would give the Lord the opportunity to start to work in your heart. If you've abandoned it, it would give the Lord the opportunity to begin to draw you back to himself. The Lord, when he said regarding this closet, he said there was a caution or a warning. He said, when you go into it, he said, make sure you shut the door. In other words, it's a private affair. It's just between me and the Lord. Now, there was a great um, preacher called... Um, let me think of his name, Ari Torrey, Reuben Torrey. And Reuben Torrey, before the Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit, Reuben Torrey used to go to prayer, and you know what? He used to say, how long do I have to do this? And he was been absolutely honest. I mean, how long do I have to do this? He spent half an hour or whatever in prayer, and said, whew, boy, I'm glad I have that over. Get out for the rest of the day. But when the Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit, Reuben Torrey said, how long can I do this? Something happened. When the Holy Spirit filled Reuben Torrey, Reuben Torrey loved being alone with the Lord. You see, dear, dear child of God, come with me and I'll carry you down a, a route. I, I, I hope it's logical for you. You see, if, if we love the Lord as we state then the closet is the nearest thing to heaven we can get because it's being alone just with God. Because after all, heaven is going to be being in the presence of God eternally. That's what it's going to be. So if I can't do it for a little while on earth, well, I mean, there's going to have to be awful changes in me to get me to the other side. There's going to have to be such a shock to the system. And I do think, for all of us, I'm sure, when we get to the other side, it, it will be a shock, a good shock, but it'll be a shock. Because we didn't really experience much of the presence of God in our lives. We didn't give the Lord time to speak to us. 
So there must be a caution. The Lord said you need to, to get alone. You need to wait in God's presence. Find that place where you meet alone with the Lord. Now, there's a few very th simple things that the Lord tells us to do. In verse 7, he said, when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. He said, don't, don't go down the road of ritual. Don't think that because you say lots of words that God will hear you. And of course, as I've probably said before, the words of, of Charles Spurgeon are very, very apt. Spurgeon said, it is not the length of our prayers, it is the weight of our prayers that matters. Not the length, but the weight. You see, when you come to God and you're in earnest with God, then God will hear. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says that Elijah prayed earnestly, earnestly. And it's always a joy to be in the company of people who are earnest after the Lord, earnest in prayer. But God calls us to earnestness in the place of prayer. Now, I'm sure there are some who are saying to me, we, we have heard this before, and, and this, is, this is what worries me among evangelical churches, fundamentalist churches. This is the problem because we have heard it before. That's the problem. And the, dan the big danger is that we become immune to it. We have heard all the truth, but we are immune to it. We don't actually go home from a church service and say, I've got to change my life. We don't do that. And as a result, we become immune to truth. And you know what happens when you do that? God recognizes that you're not listening. And what God does is God says, well, obviously you're not going to listen, so there's really not much point in me speaking to you. It is a fact that a lot of the most fundamental evangelical churches today are seeing the very least happening. The very least happening in the church. That in itself ought to be some kind of stirring to us. But I'm not talking about a, a fellowship. Or, I'm talking about the individual because that's, that's the heart of the matter. It's the heart of the matter is the individual. The Lord says don't have repetitious words. Don't be thinking the more I pray about it. You know, I remember several years ago I was in a real um, predicament. Um, it happened to be uh, over a certain issue. I'll not tell you what it was, but it was a real predicament and I couldn't get out of it. And uh, I was praying. Boy, was I praying. I said, Lord, come and help us. And my wife, and we prayed every day, Lord, please come and, and intervene in this situation. And we prayed and we prayed. And every time I was thinking about it, I prayed about it. And every time I thought about it, I prayed about it. Every time I got in the car, I prayed about it. And then as time went on, it got tighter and more difficult. And my wife and I used to sit at the table and say, well, he's not, he's not, he's not going to do anything. I'd say, yeah, he's not going to do anything. And, and eventually over our meal, we would have the meal and we would, we would say, well, God's obviously not listening. And, and then we'd go back and we'd pray and, and, and we just prayed all the time. It was getting nowhere. Because the only reason we were praying was because we didn't feel he had heard the last time. So we thought that the more we would talk about it to God, then God would do something. And it was really, really difficult. And I went along to see a friend of mine, and uh, we were sitting together talking about something else. And I said to him, listen, I want to share something with you, just that you would pray for us. And I, and I told him what was going on. And I said, I have prayed times sick praying. Well, he said, that's where you're wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, you need to stop praying. You need to stop praying. Because he said, you have prayed yourself into unbelief. And you are now praying completely in unbelief. And that was absolutely right. I didn't have any confidence that God was listening to me. I mean, my wife and I would have said, he's not hearing us, and then we'd just go back to prayer. I mean, we didn't believe he was. We already had, were in absolute unbelief, totally paralyzed in faith. Do you know the amazing thing that happened? That gentleman, whenever before I left, he said, listen, let's pray about it. Just, I don't want you to pray anymore about it. 
And he just prayed the simplest wee prayer that the Lord would intervene. Inside 24 hours, that issue that was insoluble was totally solved. It really was a miracle, but it was solved. But I learned something that day that that you can pray and pray and pray in unbelief, and you're wasting your time. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. You need faith when you pray. You need faith. And let me tell you where you'll get faith. In the closet when you meet with God. You can't get it anywhere else. Faith comes from God. It is a gift from God. And God gives it supernaturally. Gives it supernaturally. I was talking to a gentleman last evening in my house, and he said to me about uh, this man last year at a mission came to the Lord. Really unique conversion came to the Lord, farmer. Not, not a pulpit man at all. But his wife is very opposed, and he's gone through a lot of problems with his wife. But his young daughter had, her foot was covered in all these farukas. Been to hospital, surgery, everything for two years, and they had tried everything, and they couldn't help her. Couldn't do anything for her. Now, this guy's only saved now, I don't know, six, seven, eight months or something. And, uh, well, he has been praying. He has been in the closet. He's a young, young Christian. But he's in earnest. And so he was thinking about his daughter and this thing, and his wife was opposed to him, and And he told this man, he said, you know, I did a really unusual thing. He said, I was talking to God about my daughter's feet. And he said, this really strange thing happened. He said, it wasn't a voice, but it was something really clear, as though it were a voice inside me, and it said, it's done. And he said, I can't explain it. I have no way of explaining it, but I knew that my daughter was not going to need any more of the doctor's attention. She wasn't going to need anything more. (coughs) He prayed over her, and that was it. They went to see the doctor at the next appointment, and all the farukas were gone. Two years of work (laughs) by the doctors. Couldn't do a thing. The doctor had a big query as to how this could happen, because this, this couldn't happen after all the work they had put into it. But you see, what had happened was, as a young Christian, the Lord had given him faith. He he, he just found that he was able to say, Lord, I just know. He didn't didn't try to pray it up. He didn't try to create it. God just gave it to him. God gives faith. Now, not only is there a caution here regarding vain repetition, the Lord wants you and I to be honest. I couldn't emphasize that enough, that the Lord wants us to be honest when we come to Him. Forget the list and all. Some people have that big a list they have to go through. I mean, they haven't time to think even that they're in the presence of God. It's just this long list. Now, lists have their place, I'm sure. But, but this thing isn't about bringing, uh, going to Tesco's. This is about coming into the presence of the Creator. So the Lord says, when you come, don't go down this whole route of multiplicity of talk, thinking you'll be heard. But he said, when you come, he said, I make a promise. In verse 6, he said, when you've shut the door and you talk or pray to your God in secret, your Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward you openly. Now, this is the blessing. The Lord said, whenever you come empty, whenever you come broken, whenever you come exhausted, when you come and there's no hope for you, and you feel there's no purpose for life anymore, and you feel that everything has gone wrong, the Lord said, I want you to come to the closet, because I'll be there. It's my covenant that I make with you as my child. I'll be there. If you don't turn up, I'll still be there, but you'll just let me wait. I'll wait. Isn't God so gracious? Isn't he so gracious? Can you imagine the Queen of England waiting for you to turn up? 
and you never bother, or I never bother, and, and the queen just waits there. Could you imagine that? It's unheard of. Nobody keeps the queen waiting. But here the Lord said, I'll be there, I, I'll be at that place, and I see in secret. He says, I see. And he said, when I see you coming into me to talk to me, and he said, I commune with you, he said, I'll reward you openly. He said, you know, your life will be changed. And he said, things that are irreconcilable inside you, wounds that, that, that can't be healed by doctors or by anybody. He said, the deepest hurts and wounds, the deepest issues that, that nobody, you, you just keep them under wraps. You just, you're just trying to make through with them. He said, if you came into my closet and you met with me, he said, I would reward you. And he said, it, it would affect you in your ordinary life. I'll reward you openly. I can change you. You see, friends, the reason why the desires or the longings for the closet, because we have to face that, why is it as Christians that we have a lack of desire for being alone with God? What's the reason? Well, I've mentioned this before, and it's a bit repetitive, but nevertheless I have to because it is the truth. There are three things that keep Christians from enjoying the presence of God. Three things. The first thing is sin sin in our lives. The Bible says your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have sin in my life that I refuse to confess, refuse to repent of, God doesn't hear my prayers. God doesn't hear. He says, if I regard iniquity, if I hold to iniquity in my life, he says, God will not hear me. And so, where there is sin in our lives that will kill our desire for the closet, that's why you never find ungodly people interested in prayer, maybe interested in outward show and so on, but not interested in prayer because they don't know God. They've never received the Lord. So they don't have that desire because sin has separated them from God. But if they repented of their sin and received the Lord, then they would have a desire for the Lord. And so we find that, that, that their sin is the first reason why Christians have obstacles or a difficulty with prayer. The second one is wounds, wounds that have happened in their lives, where people have had things happen, deep traumas in their life. Maybe in childhood, maybe, maybe in later life, but there's a thousand reasons. But really deep traumatic experiences in childhood or areas where they've been rejected. Some people get through life and they seem to handle these things. Others don't. And so they have wounds and they have a broken heart. And the Bible says that the Lord came to heal the broken heart. Hearted. You know, I may have told you this before, but I want to just give you, the, give you the idea where I'm coming from. There was a young lady that really desired to go forward with the Lord, and uh, she contacted um, us through meetings, and uh, a few of us went to pray with her. And, and this lady, what had happened was she had come to the Lord, but a lot of things had happened in her childhood that weren't good. And although she was saved, she was trying to go forward, but was always being thrown back. She just couldn't make progress spiritually. She tried, but she couldn't. Now, the average person, the average Christian, would have said, oh, well, she's not showing much interest in spiritual things. But she was. But there was something throwing her back every time. And we went to pray with her, and it was quite a revelation for me personally whenever this young lady was prayed for, because she was able to tell us about an experience that happened when she was a child regarding her grandfather. And she had gone to her grandfather's home, and uh, her grandfather had abused her. Now, it's amazing what goes on even among Christians. Just last week, I was with a lady 
who came to the Lord. She's a, the number of issues this lady has is longer than this church. But do you know what happened at the start of this lady? Her, her, her life's a mess. She came to the Lord recently, and she's, she's starting to make progress. But do you know what happened to her? An elder in a church, a saved man, brought her to meetings, and she trusted the Lord as a child. She was brought to his house, and he raped her. And he died and was buried a lovely Christian. My dear friend, evangelical doesn't mean much today, I can tell you. Saved. <laughs> saved? Buried saved? I don't know how the man stood, but he was a leading elder in an evangelical church. That girl's life was ruined. Ruined. And she's just starting slowly to pick up the pieces. The other lady that we prayed with, we said to her, you know, when we're praying for you, you might find that you'll go back to this event that occurred when you were a child. And that's exactly what happened. When we began to pray for her, she started in front of us to relive the event. And it was pitiful to watch as this young woman in her thirties began to behave like a little child of four, and the terror in her face as she relived the events of what happened in the barn with her grandfather. And the Lord came, it was wonderful to watch, the Lord came to that lovely young woman, and you know as she went through that grief, the Lord began to minister to her and take all that hurt away, took it all away, she had buried it. She had hid it down inside. She had a wounded, broken heart. The Lord came and healed her heart. And God helped me to see that day that, that there are many people who have broken hearts. And Jesus can heal them. Jesus can heal them. And I don't know where your heart might be broken today. I don't know. But I want you to know that Jesus can heal your broken heart. You see, friends, what hinders us is, is sin, wounds, and demons, evil spirits. I had a man with me <clears throat> a while back, lovely Christian, Really keen to go forward with the Lord, same problem, couldn't go forward, wanted to go forward, couldn't go forward, always thrown back. Again, anybody saying would have said he's unstable, he's up and down, he doesn't know where he is. That would have been the kind of guy he was. Came along and talked to me. Again, things happened in his childhood that were quite bizarre. But he began to tell me, he said, you know, I have awful anxiety. He said, I am anxious on a scale of one to ten. I'm at eight all the time. And he said, my, my, my stomach, he said, I can't hardly take food. He was just like a whippet. He said, I don't know how much longer I can go on. This has gone on for years, three years now. Now, sometimes people can have anxiety. Sometimes people can just be anxious and, and you can need help. I understand that. I mean, that, that's, that's, I mean, I'm sure all of us to some extent have experienced anxiety. But this guy, what he found was every time he went forward spiritually, this anxiety went to phew. And as he was prayed with, these spirits began to leave him, began to leave him. All related to the anxiety. And this freedom came. <laughs> and you know, before he left, he, he said to me, he said, you know, I feel so light. He said, I can't describe how I feel. And that guy is moving forward now. You see, you can be held back by sins, by wounds, or by demons. 
what are the practical areas if I, and, and what I'm trying to do this morning is to talk as, as simply as I can. I'm not here really to preach to you. I just want to share with you. I want to encourage you because I know that the Lord wants you to turn up at the closet. I, I'm, I'm attempting to understand how the Lord feels because many times I didn't turn up. Many times I failed and the Lord has been so gracious to me. But I'm, I'm learning as a Christian that, that it's never lost time in the closet. It's never lost time. I'm learning more and more in my Christian life to enjoy the closet. You see, what hinders us is, is, is unforsaken sin. We've mentioned that already. If there's sin in your life that you haven't forsaken, then that will kill the closet. You can go in, but nothing's going to happen. And what'll happen is you'll be bored in it. You'll be bored. And the reason you're bored in it is because God's not there. I mean, God's not going to turn up with you if you're sitting with a heap of sin. If you're carrying a heap of unconfessed sin and you have no intention of dealing with it, I mean, God's not a fool. He's not a fool. God comes where he's wanted. It's as simple as that. And if you want him enough, he'll be there. A lot of people say, I want God, but they don't want to change their lives. So they don't want God. There might be unforgiveness. There might be people that you have issues with. The Lord says, if you have anything against your brother, go and be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. If I have an issue or I know there's a brother has an issue with me, the Lord said, listen, forget about all this worship, the meetings and all. Forget about the whole lot. Forget about it. Go and get reconciled. And then come and offer your gift. Unforgiveness. There can be so many areas that quell our desire for the closet. Now you say, where would I begin to go to the closet and find out what's wrong. Well, this is the wonderful thing. I, I find this amazing as a Christian. If you're converted and the Holy Spirit then dwells inside you, he knows everything. The Holy Spirit knows everything. I mean, if God wanted, he could tell me how far Saturn is from Pluto. I don't know if men know that or not, but I know God knows it. If there was some great secret to be known about the universe, how it came, how, how, it, how it all came about, or what the, these particles are that they're trying to find, the per, you know, the creative particle. I mean, if God wanted to tell me, he could tell me. It's no problem, because the Holy Spirit lives inside me, and the Bible tells me he knows all things. This is amazing. I, I have God inside me. So when I go into the closet, all I have to do is say, Lord, I really don't know what I'm meant to do here. I'm really at a loss because I have never adventured, had an adventure down this route. I've done religion. I've done church. I've done denominations. I've done Bible versions. I've done this. I've done that. I've done, but I've never done this. I've never sought the presence of God. Never done that. So, Lord, I really don't know. Now, I've been told from the church that you're meant to read your Bible and maybe use Dehan or some wee book like that, and that'll, or maybe some wee verses, and read those, and then you say we wee prayer. I've been told that. But, Lord, I'm glad when it's over, and to be honest with you, it hasn't made much of a difference in my life. You know, you'd have to get honest and say, Lord, it's not working. It hasn't worked. But I want it to work. So what I'm doing is I'm coming in here just like a P1 student, and I'm just saying, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, would you come and show me what you don't like in my life? Would you come and show me the things that you know about that I don't know about? And would you point them out? Now, I've said before, perhaps you think as a Christian today, I have a besetting sin. There's an area where I feel the Lord. And if I could get that sin solved, I'd be, oh, I'd be the Apostle Paul. You are deceived. 
The Lord has permitted you to have a besetting sin, not because he can't deal with it, but in order to drive you to the closet, that you will come to the place where you say, God, I cannot adequately live this life. I am making a sham of it. I'm a complete mess. If people knew the way I really lived, if people knew that what I really did, how I behave in private, if people knew it, they wouldn't come near me. God, I'm, God says, that's why I want you. I know you're a mess. I love you, but I know you're a mess. But I don't want you to play church anymore. I don't want you to continue this sham thing called Christianity today. I don't want you to be in that. I want you to come to the closet and tell me exactly where you are. And you say, but God, would you take away my besetting sin? The Lord says, when I get you alone with me, I'll show you sins you never dreamed of. I'll show you things about your life you never saw before, because my presence is light. I'm light. And in me there is no darkness at all. And when you get alone with me and you get honest with me and you sit there and let me speak to you, you'll find that your besetting sin is the least of your problems. The least of your problems. Because I'm a holy God and I hate sin. And I come to search you. Don't we sing it sometimes? Search me, O God. Well, that's where it happens. Well, some people say, what would you do in the closet? I remember a man saying one time, they were having a night of prayer at a church, and he said, you know, this fella, he had only been used to going to the average church prayer meeting, and he says, what do you do after you pray? And he thought everybody would say a prayer, and that'd be it over. That was as much as he knew about prayer. <laughs> a night of prayer, he says, what are we going to do at it? I just thought they were going to eat buns and lick lemonade or drink lemonade and lick ice cream. You see, that's one of the reasons why there is no prolonged prayer meetings anymore in our churches. Now, thank God for those places where there is, but there's not many churches now, I'm sure you're aware of, not many churches where there's nights of prayer. Now, why would it be that there's no nights of prayer? The reason's very simple. One, people don't see the need for it, and secondly, even if there was a need for it and they saw it, there's not the men in the church to do it. Because men are not praying. If you don't pray at home, you can't pray in the church. Can't, you don't pray in the closet, you'll not, pray, you'll not be able to hold any length of time in a, in a prayer meeting or a night of prayer. And so the Lord is wounded in the house of his friends. He knows he's not wanted. And the Lord feels that. The Lord feels that. He feels he's not wanted. You see, friends, when we come to the closet, Robert Murray McShane was greatly used by the Lord in Scotland, and McShane died a young man in his late twenties. He said, it is my noblest and most fruitful employment, and is not to be thrust into any corner. E. M. Bounds, the great author on prayer, said, nothing can atone for neglect of prayer. You see, we can't, we can't neglect this place of prayer and expect to be strong spiritually. It can't happen. This is where we get our strength. It was to this place that the Lord spoke to Elijah, who had been before the king and had said, I stand in the presence of the Lord. And he told him there would be no rain until he spoke. And the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Elijah, and he said, Elijah, go hide thyself. And he hid, and he waited on God. So what do I do? Let's be practical as we close. What do we do regarding this closet? If I go to it, right, I, I say to God that, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. This Christianity is not working. I, I'm, I'm not functioning. What, what am I supposed to do? Well, the first thing to realize is that you don't have to be talking 
to be in prayer. You don't, you don't have to be, you know, galloping something out before God to be in prayer. You, you don't have to be going through a list. I'm learning as I go along, and I have a lot to learn, but I'm learning. Sometimes I, I can go into the place where I pray, and I can be there perhaps, say, for an hour, and not say a word. Not say a word. Not ask God for anything. But I just come and I say, Lord, I just want you to know that although there's a lot of things to be done and there's things of relative importance, I just want you to know that I'm available to you. I want you to know I'm not coming to ask for anything. You see, when I was a little boy, my father used to come in from the farm at night, and I was the youngest of the family, and he used to come in, and there was two chairs. My dad sat in one, my mother at the other, and this stove in the middle. Now, of course, like all little boys, I would have come on occasion, said, I want this, I want that, I want the other. But I do recall uh, vividly, as a little boy, I would go in at night, and when he would come in and sit down, I would run over before the other girls would get a chance. I would run and jump and sit on his knee. Now, I didn't ask him for anything. I just wanted to sit on my dad's knee. Hadn't seen him all day. And dear friends, he's our father. We say he's our father. And so I can just come to him and say, Lord, I'm just, reverently speaking, I'm just coming to, to be with you. Just want you to know that I love you. I, I, I don't have to say anything. You know my heart. You don't read my words anyway. You read my heart. I want you to know that. And if there is anything that you maybe want to say to me as I just wait here quietly, maybe there's things you want to say to me, Lord, I would like you to speak to me. And maybe there's a sin in my life. Maybe there's an attitude to a brother or a sister. Maybe there's, maybe there's somebody I have to be reconciled. I don't know, Lord, but I just want you to come. And I want you to feel an absolute freedom to speak to me. And by your grace, Lord, I'll obey what you show me. Can I say to you, dear friends, whenever you do that, and you go out into the world, you feel the difference. You feel the difference. And you sense a presence. You know, you say, well, how do you sit there? I mean, years ago, if you'd have said to me, sit 10 minutes, I'd have been bonkers. I'd have been ready to run for the hills. I wanted out. You say, well, why is it that you can sit for an hour? Well, how do, how do you do that? I'll tell you why. I become very conscious of the divine presence. That's why. I become really conscious that the Lord is here, that he's with me, that he has absolute control of my heart, and I'm enjoying a peace that passes all understanding. I'm enjoying his love, like liquid love, something of, of heaven on earth to my soul. I, I trust you can understand why then that you, you would like the closet. And, and if you neglect it and go away from it, you see there's only this world. You know, we, we say as Christians, don't we? We say there's nothing there for us, but boy, we make a good go at it, don't we? <laughs> there's nothing there for us. But boy, we, we, we have first spent our resources after it. <laughs> and here's the Creator at the closet saying, I, I've waited for you for years. Years. I'm still waiting. Still loved you. Long to reveal myself to you. Long to bless you, long to enrich you in life, and, and also to enrich you eternally. That's, that's the longing, because that's my heart. But I need you to come to me. I need you to come. I trust you can understand that when it comes to seeking God, you need time. You need time in the closet. You need time with God. You can't rush it. <laughs> you need time. And if you don't have the time, there's something wrong. You need the book of God. Lay other books aside if you want to. I'm not telling you what to do, but, but this book's enough. 
This book's enough. Just this book. You say, well, I read the Bible, I don't get much out of it, I don't see it. Of course you don't, because so many things maybe in your life that need sorted. Of course it's going to be a dry book. But if you come honestly to him and say, Lord, you know, please, come and speak to me. As you read the book, the Holy Spirit will come to you and he'll interpret it. And you'll get a love for the scriptures. And you begin to pray over them. And the promises of God are imparted to you. You need faith whenever you come to pray. Dear, where do I get that from? Well, that comes from the Lord. That comes from him. As you spend time in his presence, he will grant you faith. He will give you the ability to believe things that you couldn't have believed. He'll give you that ability. I'm amazed sometimes. God has given me the ability to believe him on certain issues in my life. And I sometimes say, Lord, that's absolutely amazing what you have told me is going to happen. But I don't strive over that. I don't plead and beg. And I just, every day, I just thank you, Lord, you're going to do that. Because he gave the faith. And when he gives it, all you have to do is praise him. All you have to do is thank him. Dear friends, this morning, I don't know what your need is. I don't know whether you're out of the closet, in it a wee bit, spending time earnest. I don't know. But God can communicate with you there. Let me close with a story. I may have told you this before. There's a dear friend of mine, um, I know him a number of years now. He's a very busy man. He has a huge farm, huge. He has millions of these wee chicks, you know the wee yellow boys. That, and, and he has brought me sometimes, he brought me to one of these houses one day. And I mean, they're, they're, I don't know what length these things are. You'd need a car to drive from one end to the other. And he opened the door and all these wee yellow balls of fluff were running everywhere. Millions of them. Millions of them. Now, he's a busy man. He's a farmer. He has a lot of responsibilities. You know, But you know in the corner of one of those sheds, he has a little room. There's all these gears and electric cables and stuff and all. And then there's a wee place where there's a Bible sitting and a chair. He says, "This, this this is my closet here. This is where I meet God. But are you not too busy? No, 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 I'm not too busy. See, friends, listen. You can have a chicken too many. You can have a chicken too many. (laughs) Whenever you have something that kills the closet, you have too much. When you're too busy for God, you have too much. And your blessings have become a curse. Why did I tell you that? Well, I may have told you this before. Years years ago, my wife and I, we had moved into where we're living now, and we had an old mobile. And uh, I went to light the fire, and we had nothing to light the fire, and didn't have money either, but nothing to light the fire. And I I prayed, I said, Lord, please, you know we need sticks, it's cold outside, and the children will be home, and I'm nothing to light the fire, and Lord, it's going to be, you know, they'll be whinging, saying we're cold. No, I said, Lord, please, you know we need sticks. And I just prayed like that and I left it. And honestly, inside five minutes, I got a call. And it was from this man. This busy, busy farmer. And he said, Alan, do you need sticks? I said, funny you should mention that. He said, I was praying for you this morning. And the Lord said to me, that man needs sticks. Now I got the sticks. It was wonderful to get the sticks. 
But this busy farmer's hearing from God. This busy farmer is in touch with God. My friend, are you in touch with God? Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love to us, Lord. And the love you have for us is beyond our comprehension. We confess, Lord, that we have abandoned you. We have forsaken that place alone where we should love and seek God. We pray that you would forgive us, Lord, and you would put in our hearts that desire to return to the place where we meet God. In Jesus' name, amen.